Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome, and uh, so I am definitely glad that uh, everyone's able to spend time with us this morning, that we're all safe. That's not a given these days. And so it's just, it's us, it's so good to see everybody. And, um, you know, between Friday and today, it's just such a, such a blessing to touch bases and uh, see how everyone's doing because, um, you know, it's, it's almost somewhat miraculous now if we can go through and, um, and, and have seen everyone throughout this whole period, which we have, and um, my family is safe, I hope your family is safe also, so um, we keep everyone in prayer, and uh, in these times, this is our time to shine. This is our time to, you know, this is our time to, to have God be experienced. This is our time to, I mean, all times present opportunities for God, but this is, these are different times, difficult times, and, uh, you know, no matter whether we see it or not, in these times, people are, people are struggling to make it through, because uh, going through this time period, there's so much sometimes hanging over our heads, uh, in terms of what the future is going to be like and uh, so keep that in mind keep in mind that you know these are these are difficult times for a lot of people church people know how to fake it well you know to act like everything is good when it's falling apart so in a time when things are actually falling apart because there are a lot of questions. People have questions concerning even the thing that's supposed to make it better, the, um, you know, whether or not we should uh, take the injection, not take the injection, which one to take. Um, so many questions and even things that are supposed to bring healing and bring relief brings questions. You know, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is um, raising questions because even though it's one, it's one dose, but it's the one that's having, you know, people develop women in general difficulties because of it. So, you know, when we hear these things, uh, you know, and, and maybe even though our family members are not directly affected by COVID. Um, I know we had in the last month three people from work that are um, affected by COVID. So, and you know, the whole time, the whole year that passed, over a year, we didn't really have any uh, too much effect. So keep in mind, people are, um, people are struggling you know, so that we can be ready if God would say, you know, reach out to this person or reach out to that person that we have it on our mind to uh, touch bases, at least with brothers and sisters, ones that we haven't heard from might be in isolation, that we, um, you know, we make sure that we are mindful of, of people being safe. So, let's open with a word of prayer. Merciful Father, we thank you for this, this day, this another day that you've given us, another day to experience the joy of the Lord, another day to experience your presence, to experience your grace. And uh, as our hearts are open to your word this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just um, fill us with words that would, again, guide and lead us in the way we should go. And uh, this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, um, I could ask this question and probably have a different answer each time, but 
why so much emphasis on the fruit of the Spirit? Why, why is walking in the Spirit such an important thing to ponder and, and reason about? I think, well, one thing is that this allows us to position ourselves or behave in a manner that is consistent with our new position that we were born into when we became believers. I consider what Paul write, you know, reveals in 1 Corinthians 6.19, for instance. And I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. It says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and that you are not your own property? You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made His own. So then honor and glorify God with your body. So here Paul reveals that what? He says we are not our own anymore. That positionally we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so with our bodies we, we need to honor God. We need to be presenting our members to Him so that Christ, to whom we now belong, can manifest in these bodies. And so this is another reason why walking in the Spirit is important. It is it's really our responsibility so that we can fulfill this call. And we should consider it. We should consider it a call. So walking in the Spirit allows us to, to discharge what we have received from God in our time when we spend time with Him, whether in prayer or other spiritual disciplines where we are receiving from God. And cultivating the fruit of the Spirit allows us to align with God so that we can demonstrate what is naturally His character in and through us. So Paul puts it this way as recorded in 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 14 through 18. He says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. But what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or Belial, depending on which, um, which version you read. Or what, what does a, a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out of them, come out from them, and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So, cultivating the fruit of the Spirit allows for the contrast that is needed to demonstrate the difference spoken of in this passage. God presents a different way of doing things that, even if it looks the same as when an unbeliever is doing it, it's different because it's empowered by the will of God. A believer's motives... An unbeliever's motives come from their own beliefs and, and will and, and is empowered by what they purpose to do in their actions. And being yoked together with an unbeliever then will result in two people going in different directions as far as the outcome of their actions. For the unbeliever, their life's work will result in some sort of self-satisfaction. Uh, feeling good about themselves because they have accomplished something that they determine will give them a reward that brings them joy and fulfillment if, if, that's, if, if, if that's what they purpose. The result for a believer is that God will fulfill in us what He purposed to do when He had the prophet record this from earlier times that we just read. It showed that this is, is what God determined to do when He separated Israel as His own people from the rest of the world. 
God determined to walk with and walk among, and God wanted to be, he wants to be father. Despite the unfaithfulness of God's people, God's faithfulness is on display in us in that he was able to bring about the fulfillment of what he purposed to do. So we are the fulfillment of this purpose of God. Walking in the Spirit is the fulfillment of this purpose of God. It brings God joy to have his word fulfilled in us when he gets to live with us, walk with us. I like to build things, always have, ever since I can remember. And there's a certain satisfaction that is felt when something I'm putting together is completed. So much so that I look forward to doing the next project. Now, some people like to accomplish different things in their day that brings them satisfaction. And when, when, I get to, when I get to share this with them, I get to share their satisfaction. Cindy and I like to go out in our kayaks. And when, when we do this, and I'm helping to clean the kayaks at the end of our time on the water, there is satisfaction in that we have completed something that brings us joy. Then we plan a vacation. You guys probably have planned this year. And, and you get to see it through with family and friends. You know, these things bring satisfaction. The satisfaction, the joy we, 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 you know, we experience when we went through that list and we saw everything on the list, visited, visited every place on the list. Think back how it felt when all of this came together. And consider this, God has been planning this trip with you for thousands of years. And now he gets to see it through. When we can separate our things from the, the things that hinder, when we are able to align and, uh, and unite with other believers instead of finding our satisfaction with unbelievers and in the world, God is able to enjoy his walk with us and in us. When we're able to align with God and seek His kingdom, His kingdom first and, and, and His righteousness instead of falling back or making unrighteousness our default, God is able to enjoy His walk with us and in us. Ever have a friend come and visit? Friends we like, for instance, not ones that we are tolerating for a period of time. Do we not like to introduce them to our new friends, for instance? Hi everyone, this is my friend Nancy and Jim. They, they, they are visiting from Ohio, enjoying our nice weather here in Florida. Don't it feel good to do that? And we have been, been planning this trip with our friends for however long, and, and now we, we are, you know, we're finally here and we, we get to introduce them. And they're, they're, you know, everyone, we get to share stories about the time we spent together. Did I say before that God has been planning this trip, this visit with you, this relationship for thousands of years? And now he gets to share stories with us. And when we cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, he gets to be experienced by our friends. Consider this, taking from 1 Peter 3.15, reading from the Message Bible. It reads, If with heart and soul you're doing good, do you think you can be stopped? Even if you suffer for it, you're still better off. Don't give the opposition a second thought. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention, in adoration before Christ, your Master. Be ready to speak up and, and, and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are. Be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are. And always with the utmost courtesy. So when we're, we're seeking God's righteousness, cultivating the fruit of, the, of God's Holy Spirit, introducing them in our circumstances with our heart and soul, the power of God goes ahead of us. Whatever the outcome, we have to trust that 
we are, we are better off than the alternative. A good outcome that is, is accomplished outside of God's will and purpose is not a good outcome at all. Walking in the Spirit, even if we suffer for it, we're still better off than the alternative. So use circumstances to introduce others to Jesus, to introduce others to our Father. Be ready to speak up and, and tell anyone, says, who asks why you're living the way you are, and always with the utmost courtesy. Let it be about God and not do what we're so used to doing, seeking self-satisfaction. God planned this visit a long time ago. Let him be the reason you live the way you do. When people are experiencing natural characteristics like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, do it with gentleness. You know, because we can, we can do these things selfishly. We have a, the world has an interpretation of what love is, what joy is, and, and what peace is, what patience is, what kindness is. We used to use these words, like I said before, when we weren't believers. So let the reason why we live the way we do, and when people are experiencing us, let it be because of what God is demonstrating in our lives. Gentleness, <clears throat> as it says in some translation, that's the, the fruit that we're trying to get to today. It's important to have these things in mind though that we talked about when we think about fruit of the Spirit and especially when we think about gentleness. Gentleness is about delivery. It's the how of the others, right? Christopher Wright starts out this, this, uh, with this regarding this precious way in which God, ex God is expressed. He says, well, if patience is the ability to endure hostility and criticism without anger, then gentleness is the ability to endure such things without aggression. Gentleness shows itself when I've learned that the Christ-like way to respond to conflicts and quarrels, rejections, unfairness or harsh words spoken against me is not with bluster or self-defense, not with harsh and aggressive words, not with prickles and spikes, but rather with softness, controlling my tongue and my temper. He goes on to write, gentleness means being very aware that the other person is a human being with feelings too. And maybe that person, even the one who is being very nasty, is just as hurt as I am by whatever is going on between us. End of quote. See, these qualities, gentleness, and its counterpart, humility, they were not qualities or characteristics that were sought after in the world that Paul wrote to when he wrote this epistle to Galatians. Humility was not a desired quality that people in the Roman Empire sought to have. Real men in these times would be characterized as strong, powerful, and dominant. And these qualities still dominate, are dominant, or dominate the world today. When people discuss this, this way of God as expressed by Jesus, you know, gentleness, Words are spoken like, I'm not going to let anybody walk all over me. Imagine when Jesus came on the scene and started speaking words like, love your enemies. How that must have gone over. And believers still have a real issue with the idea of being gentle with someone, someone who have done us wrong. It's difficult to find this quality even in Christian leaders. From my experience, people prefer a good dose of aggression when they need to get a point across. Humility is fine, very interesting discussion point, 
But I find that in the thick of things, it's not the trait that people trust to, to move and to shake. You have people in the world who are looked upon as good people, strong people, are not lacking in these two qualities. The church has definitely made these qualities more acceptable. I still find though that the people I know as believers, even for myself at times, in the moment when it can make the most impact, it's usually, usually the trait that gets ditched for some form of aggression or aggressive means of expressing ourselves. Interestingly enough, God is spoken of in terms that definitely paint some of the most gentle of images when speaking of his character and how we, he engages his people. Psalm 23 Verses 2 through 3, for instance, reads, you know, words that, that I have found tremendous comfort when repeating. I found, found these, these for, a matter of fact, even before I was a believer. Psalm 23, I knew Psalm 23, I think, even before I was a believer. Verses 2 and 3 says, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. These words can come to mind in the, in the most appropriate of times and undergird responses while I'm speaking. How can we not appreciate that God does not only provide for needs, but the psalmist paints a picture that promotes good mental health also. Restoration of the inner person for His name's sake. This is how God wants to be associated. This is how God wants to be known. Now Elijah, he experienced this firsthand. You know, after a strong show of force against the prophets of Baal, Jezebel threatened Elijah's life and, and this triggered a weak moment for Elijah and some fear and some depression. He wanted God to take his life but he was awakened, he, 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 went, he went to the cave and he, he, he fell asleep and, and then he was awakened by an angel who, who brought him food. Imagine that. An angel brought the prophet food. Baked in heaven? Maybe. And this was some very efficient food because verse 8 of 1 Kings 19 reads like this. So he got up and he ate and he drank. And with the strength of that food, he traveled 40 days and nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And so when he gets there, I like what God asks Elijah in verse 11. It, this, is a, this is a 1 Kings 19, of verse 11. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? A master counselor God is. If you have ever been to counseling, first question, so why are you here today? puts things into perspective. You know, it gives you the opportunity to state what you're looking for in a non-threatening way. It gives you ownership of the process going forward. A gentle approach when you consider this, that God is one who knows of what we have need before we ask. Elijah makes his case before God and he admits his passion for God's work but admits that he's worn out and perhaps, you know, subsequently wants out because he's worn out. And God hears him out and then responds in, in, in what amounts to be one of the, the most impressive expressions of God in the prophets. Verses 11 through 13 reads like this. Then he, God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came, a, 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 it, it's described different ways, a small voice, a gentle breeze. 
but it was enough that so when so it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came and came to him and said, "What are you doing here, Elijah?" What a demonstration! Gods usually speak with an impact that demonstrates power and might. And God showed that he can do these things. He could take down empires. He could move mountains. But he's not really about all that. He wants to be experienced personally. He asks again in the still voice, a gentle breeze that allows Elijah to come near. And after Elijah again makes his case in front of God, God tells him to get back in the game. Get some people involved through whom God can work and choose your successor. See, God can do all the thunderous things. He can do all the great wind things. You know, I remember, <clears throat> I remember, um, you know, when, when Jesus encountered, when, when the, the, you know, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, all oh, these people are hungry, send them home. You know, I, and we remember that Jesus fed the 5,000 with the five loaves right and the two fishes and but I took away from that when when they came to Jesus Jesus said give them something to eat you give them something to eat oh we ain't got enough money we don't have enough resources right and then Jesus said uh, what do you have and they brought him the, 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 the kid the kid had enough resources to feed the 5,000 but the ones who were walking with Jesus all the time, you know, they, they looked at their lack. Oh, we don't have enough. And so remember the story, how we remember. We don't remember that the disciples, you know, uh, following Jesus fed the 5,000. We remember that Jesus fed the 5,000. You know, I hear songs all the time, you know, that, that, that talks about, you know, faith uh, and and how God is moving mountains. And, and sometimes we're using a scripture where, you know, Jesus said, if you have faith as little as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, remove over to yonder place. And it will remove. God's been planning this. He's been planning this visit for thousands of years. He wants to be personal. He wants to be near. He wants to walk with us. And in order for God to walk with us, He has to be gentle because trust me, we can be a handful. <laughs> Amen? We can be a handful. But He wants to walk with us. His plan, his goal always was to be father. And he brought the plan to Israel. But they were not willing and they were not ready. So we are now the righteousness of God in Christ. We are the ones through whom God will demonstrate. We are the ones who have the message of reconciliation. We are the ones who have the mind of Christ. But God wants to be experienced. He wants to be experienced personally. He wants to be introduced. So don't miss out on, an ex on experiencing Him in this way. He wants to be close. He wants to walk with us as we walk with Him in His Spirit. And we do this by cultivating in our efforts His fruit. Father, we thank you for the opportunity, the privilege of having you demonstrate your person in and through us so that we can know, you know, when Jesus says love one another, we can know what that means. So that we can, uh, uh, we can experience you personally, close. We know you can move mountains. We know you can shake the earth. 
we can see, we, we, we experience the devastating force of storms all the time. In Elijah's case, you call that up right there just to demonstrate. But you want to be experienced in this still voice. That's why we are the temple. That's why we are your temple, so that you can be experienced personally and intimately. Give us the strength and the courage to allow this to be cultivated in, in, in us so that you can demonstrate through us to each other and to the world who you are in spirit. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. <laughs>